This is not a race against the machines. This is a race with the machines. So, uh, Azim, we, we, you, have a, you, you see that we have a good range of interests from different points of view. I think it, I, I think it sort of, uh, sort of uh, very similar to your very, very interesting podcast, where you usually go from philosophy to tech giants, right, and everything in between. Mm. So I, I would have a question to start with, but would you be comfortable with me asking a sort of a general question first? Sure, absolutely. Let's do that, yeah. From, from, from your point of view, 30, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, what are the key ingredients for us to have a better will 30, 40, 50 years from now? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And in fact, um, the question, uh, Olivia, you posed in the email, which is, you know, if, what, if we look back from 2070, what will we have done right, was a really thought-provoking one. And uh, uh, very, very helpful, actually, to uh for, for me as i thought about uh, thought about things uh, I, I mean it's it's a it's a long period of time it's also a short period of time and and the the thing that the, the primary thing that i think gives us reason for some kind of optimism is that um we have paths we have um approaches that in a sense we we know we're not humanity in 1895 or 1890 trying to figure out how we're going to fly with something that isn't a hot air balloon or a hydrogen balloon. Uh, we have an understanding of um, some quite remarkable technologies that mean that the, the problems that we might face are really more questions of collective action uh, than they are uh, fundamental science problems and i'm i'm glossing over lots of detail which we, we can t dig, dig into um and one of the, way, the ways to think about that is that um it, if you go back uh, about um just over 100 years to to uh say 1910 and you go to where i currently live um where my house is which is in a sort of suburban area um was a field uh, and it was a field attached to a farm, and I live reasonably close to the centre of London, and 200 metres away across this field was a blacksmith's. Now, by 1925, that's sort of 15 years later, the, the street map and the housing stock is as it is today. We've got a few extensions, we have a bit more glass at the back, but essentially it's the same built environment, it's the same road, it's the same sewage system, it's the same gas mains, There's, there was electricity, there were telephones. Um, and in that very short period of time, about 15 years, we, we put in place the architecture and some technological infrastructure that essentially we have lived with for the last 100 years. And arising from that technology and infrastructure um, came a whole set of, uh, affordances in our society. So we saw increased labor rights, we saw a widening of the franchise, we saw uh, the Ford production system which created new, um, uh, new methods of uh, production. Uh, we saw the arrival of modern uh, multinational companies. And these things sort of occurred within about 10 or 15 years of the technology being, being distributed. If you'd gone back to 1894, which is just 20 years before that, um, we didn't really have working cars. Benz hadn't really got his two-stroke diesel engine running. We didn't have, um, I mean, the first commercial electricity generation was um, in a tiny little British town called Godalming in Surrey in 1892. Um, so we didn't really have electricity and there were no real phone networks. So change happens really quite quickly. Now, where we find ourselves today, and, and I call this the exponential age, and, and I distance it away from a phrase you may have heard called the fourth industrial revolution, because I think that that um, constructs a, um, a, con a, 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 a continuum rather than the, the sort of energy level change that we're seeing. I mean, I think about this, and I know we've got a real physicist on this call, but as a kind of a quantum shift, right, rather than a, a sort of a continuous shift. We have these, um, these four major domains of technology. Back in 1895 to the 1920s, it was three. It was communications, power, 
and um, transport. Today it's four, it's computation in the form of um, AI and new computing fabrics uh, like quantum computing. We have within the field of um, what I roughly call life because it includes everything from genomics through to synthetic biology that is applying engineering disciplines to the art of biology through to precision fermentation a new set of technologies around how we manipulate kind of living things um, we have novel energy technologies most importantly coming along renewables and renewable storage but also uh, nuclear fusion um, that is, that is making progress. But again, it, nuclear fusion has always been making progress as anyone who's been following it will attest. And then the fourth domain being the domain of, of matter and sort of fundamentally changing how we manipulate matter uh, from effectively uh, you know, plucking things out of the ground and um, breaking them apart, whether it's chiseling Carrera marble pu pulled out of the Dolomites or cracking long chain hydrocarbons that are coming out of the ground. We're transforming that with novel materials and we're transforming it with the use of additive manufacturing, what you and I might call 3D printing, which is we, we print from the ground up. Now, the thing about those four domains is that each one of them is improving in its price performance at an exponential rate, by which I roughly mean more than 10% compounded every single year. In computing, it's much faster. You'll be familiar with Moore's law. Um, essentially, Moore's law says that for the same $1 that you spend, every 18 to 24 months, you get twice as much computing power. And com compounded over a decade, uh, that is an a, th a thousand fold improvement over 20 years. It's a million improvement over 30 years. It's a billion improvement, fold improvement. And, and so you get to the stage where, uh, you know, my, I'm, I'm just about to retire my iPhone 10 um, and my iPhone X had more computing power than any military in the world did when I was born back in 1972. Uh, and this will now, this will now li not launch nuclear weapons, um, but it will now live in my desk drawer just in case. Um, and, and behind me, you know, I've got lights that just flash when I speak because frankly lighting is now free and my electricity is renewable. Um, and so one of the things to think about is what would need to be true about the world if these four integrated rapidly accelerating technologies were going to have less impact than electricity, the car and the telephone? Like what would need to be true if you had these dramatic general purpose technologies, rolling out and improving as fast as they can, being able to distribute across a global supply chain, COVID or not, for the world to maintain the status quo. And I think that's an incredibly strong claim to make. So I make the much easier claim, which is these are bound to have significant effects on our way of life. And how far forward can we take them? And the reason I bring up my iPhone and go back to what computing was like in 1972 is because the same fundamental underlying processes that determined why computing power increased so much and got so much cheaper are now driving other domains of life, uh, that we, uh, other domains of our economic activity, including energy generation, including how we manipulate matter, including what we can do with wet lab science and uh, you know, teasing micro, uh, microorganisms to make new materials. Um, so, so when I look out at 2070, I think one of the things that causes us the biggest problems is, is our ability to access the energy that we need. Um, and first of all, we went to a stage where we just didn't know how to do that. And we were using our own motive force from our muscles. Then we started to burn trees. And in the 17th century, we found coal. And then we found oil and oil is incredibly powerful as a substance but came with all, all these kind of uh, complicated political dimensions the, the the drive towards renewables and the drive towards uh, fusion i think resolves any issue of there being oil uh, energy scarcity across our civilization across our species i mean there might be regional disparities but there won't be energy scarcity and i think the second thing is that um, the amount of computational power we would have 
um, even assuming it had improved at the rate of Moore's law, and I think uh, historically, and I think it's going to go much faster, is going to increase a thousandfold every decade. So we have five decades between now and your 2070 date, which is um, a thousand trillion fold improvement in the computational power we have and our ability to therefore figure out, figure our way through problems. So I think that there's lots of technological reasons to feel very, very optimistic about the next 50 years, because I think there are paths forward. The issues end up, I think, really being ones about um, the questions of distributive justice and questions of collective action. Great, that's exactly uh, sort of the question I wanted to ask you before I open up the floor is, in some of your interviews, you've talked about, um, you know, you've talked about how will power be distributed in this world, right? And, and I think it's been a topic of yours in, in, in many of your podcasts, right? Power is concentrated, uh, just the power decision, the power computing, uh, um, financial powers are concentrated. And it, it is one of the, it is one of the challenges we face. And one of you, in one of your interviews, you said something that I thought was really interesting. You said, if we want to build a more equitable world or future, we need to start by understanding what it would look like, right? So that, that question of power, how does it fit within that extraordinary uh, improvement in technological power? Uh, it, you know, I think it's, it's, a really, um, it's a really fundamental uh, question. And um, there's, a, there's an American um, now passed away uh, historian and sociologist of technology called Melvin, Melvin Kranzberg. Uh, and Kranzberg has a sentence where he says um, from 19, one of his books from 1958, he was incredibly far ahead of, of his time. But I'm working on my book at the moment and I read one of Kranzberg's monographs from 1960. And I'm just about to swear, so I hope nobody is offended. But, and I thought, oh, holy shit, he's literally written the whole thing five decades before me. Um, I mean, and, he, and he's managed to do it in 12 pages, whereas I'm sort of plodding on at 300. Um, so Kranzberg says this thing where he, he says, um, uh, uh, he says, technology is neither good nor bad, um, nor is it neutral. Um, and, you know, I think that the point is that technologies are always designed artifacts. Um, and one of the things that Silicon Valley did over the last 30 years, really um, uh, enabled by the mass media and enabled by the political classes, was they said in a way, look, technology is a little bit like this secret uh, and it appears and we're the priests who know the secret. And if any of you have ever seen, uh, you know, the mummy movies, right? There's always the high priest who knows the secret of the kind of what's in the sarcophagus and the mummy's tomb, and no one else is allowed to know and go into the inner sanctum of the temple. Well, that is very much how Silicon Valley and technologists thought of, presented the technology. And in doing so, they presented it as a, as a fixed thing, a thing that we couldn't question, a thing that we couldn't critically analyze, a thing that we couldn't recognize as necessarily a designed artifact and therefore open up to interpretation and critical challenge. So I think as we, as we come into these, these, sort of these discussions, um, we need to uh, be on board with the discussion about what, what shape do we want to take the development and the governance of our, of our technology uh, moving forward. Um, and, and I, you know, I think the, 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 the issue will really be um, about the locus of, um, of power more than, more than anything else. I mean, I put a question out to my Twitter feed recently. Um, so in the last decade, uh, Jeff Bezos has got 10 times richer than he was in the previous and, and the decade before that, he got 10 times richer in that previous decade. So every year he gets 10 times richer. Now, and I just asked a, a very, very simple question. You know, is there any limit to the proportion of the world's wealth that Jeff Bezos should be allowed to hold? Now, it was a sloppily worded question, deliberately slurred, so, but I used the word proportion. So I wasn't saying, well, he can become a trillionaire because Olivier and uh, Aditya will also be trillionaires. Um, no, I said the proportion, 
In other words, up to 100% with the rest of us having nothing. Now, I thought this would be a pretty uncontroversial question and everybody would say, yes, there should be a limit. We can't have a world where someone has everything and everyone else has nothing. And the thing that struck me about people's imaginations was that um, you know, I'm a venture capitalist as well, right? And I'm investing in companies. I've invested in 35 companies. And I look to make 10 times my money or 50 times my money when I invest. Um, uh, and so I'm not shy of profit making. And I really thought people would come and say, well, listen, we should have limits if there's a possibility of someone earning 100%. And I think one of your students is working around narratives of technology. I, I, the, the point there was that couldn't, people couldn't grasp this idea of the... Um, the, the sort of uncertainty that would, would have to happen for Bezos to have all the wealth. And I'm not singling him out, but I'm just saying that, that if you get your power dynamics wrong, there's no reason why, even as you raise the standard of living and the levels of relative dignity of, of lots of the population, you don't accrete all the power to a small number of people or a tiny number. And if you ever want to find a great short story about this, the, the um, Chinese science fiction uh, author Chichin Liu uh, has a short story in his uh, compilation, The Wandering Earth, called The Last Capitalist. Uh, and it's a story about a society where a single person manages to acquire everything. So I think it's a very important question. Thank you, let's, let's uh, we have a bit of time. Uh, uh, let's open it up. I'm sure there'll be there'll be questions. So, sure. uh, who wants to ask the first question? I'll 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 go ahead. Um, uh, Azim, what do you? Um, so you mentioned you mentioned like the high priest who has uh, who has this special knowledge. Um, what would you have to say about a situation where knowledge is freely available, but and yet it's only the domain of a niche amount of people who are either aware or intentionally access and learn that information? Uh, I, I overheard some doctors talking about the fact that, wow, like we've made so many advances in understanding how to live longer and age more slowly and be in better health, and yet almost no one bothers to figure out how to change their lifestyle accordingly. Yeah, that's a really, um, it's a really important question. So, um, you know, I think that there are a few different dimensions to this. One is access to technology um, and access to that knowledge and um, what groups, types of groups get access and who's denied access. Um, and that can relate to all the things that a, an, an academic institution like McGill will have had to tackle over the last 25 years. Um, uh, and you're better, better off, you know, they have better views than I do on, on that. Um, th there are other questions about the, um, the, the privatization of knowledge and in general, the privatization of the, the public space. Um, so, over the last 40 years, really as a consequence of um, Milton Friedman in the US and, and Margaret Thatcher in the UK, we had um, government-driven economic policies that essentially said anything that can, be, can live in the market should live in the market uh, and should therefore be exploited. And things, institutions that had worked really well for us, for example, um, intellectual property law, uh, patent rights and copyright, which were really important back in the 14th and 15th century when they were developed because you, you didn't have enough innovation going on, so you had to protect the innovators, have turned 600 years later into things that are used purely for uh, kind of rent-seeking behavior on the part of people who know how to, 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 to game the system. And so a really good example of this is um, what's happened with the price of insulin in the US uh, in the last... Um, 15 years, or to Google a guy called Martin Shkreli, S-H-R-K-E-L-Y, who's this horrible little hedge funder who uh, bought a bunch of Wu-Tang Clan CDs and, uh, and the rights to them and some really important uh, life-saving drugs and jacked up the price. Um, so I think, I, I think th there are, there are, you know, when you think about what's happening in your university and you think about the cost that the university pays to pay for academic research, that essentially the university has already paid for because it was people like Olivier and Anita and John who were writing it. 
and they then have to pay 10 times that to get it back from Elsevier, you see what the problem is. Um, so I think one of the things that we might get right is a dramatic move towards a global commons um, uh, uh, across not just academic research, but know-how, software, knowledge, um, insight. Uh, and for that commons to then be stewarded um, through the, the mechanisms of stewardship rather than profit seeking. Um, and then, you know, an academic you might want to look up who has thought a little bit about this. Oh, there are two. One, of course, is Eleanor Ostrom, O S T R O M, who is a Nobel laureate, uh, sadly passed away, who looked at um, how commons resources get stewarded very well. And another is. Um, is from the University of Virginia, a guy called James Boyle, B-O-Y-L-E, uh, who um, has looked at this in the context of intellectual property rights. Thank you, Eve. <clears throat> yes, thank you for your, uh, for your, your first uh, answers. Mm, I'd like to come um, um, with uh, some ch a challenging question. Um, you, you mentioned, um, so you, you mentioned, you know, the, your, your account that technology is, is most likely, you know, on the road to a better future, technology plays a role on these assumptions that technology continues to progress. And you mentioned um, energy as being one of those major things to understand, energy and power, uh, mm -hmm. r r you know, the sharing the power related to access to energy and to technology, and also just having the actual access to energy. So I'm not going to focus on the power right now. I want to focus a bit on the, the energy access. Um, there's some reasons to think that um, renewables, as we call them today, will still have geopolitical implications, uh, rare earth, materials, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you think that there is any limit, a possible limit to growth? Do you think that there is a possible limit to technological development of humans and that these limits might be encountered on our way to 2070? Mm. It's a great question. I, and there, there are three questions in there, so I'll, I'll, I'll unbundle them. So the, on the point about um, the sort of distributed access uh, to energy, um, one of the interesting things about renewables compared to, say, fossil fuels is that renewables are much more equitably distributed. So the ratio of um, the richest um, oil-bearing country in the world has about a million times more oil per square kilometer than the uh, least well endowed. And that creates uh, good news for the Saudis, which will turn into bad news in the next few years. Uh, and it makes it tougher for others. With renewables, that gap is only four to one. So Azerbaijan gets four times as much sun per square kilometer as, as Norway. And Norway gets enough sun for essentially almost infinite production of, of electricity. And that's just from, um, from solar. Of course, the sun does things indirectly through wind and wave, which are not so dependent on, um, you know, some rare earth metals that, that exist. So that was the first question. I think the second question you asked was, um, you know, are there things that can, um, that, that could go wrong between now and 2070? Um, and there are, there are loads of things that can go wrong between now and 2070. Um, I mean, I would, I would, uh, suggest that we're in um we're a little bit like um uh captain chelsea sullenberger who was a, a pilot of a 737 plane that took off from jfk airport and had a double goose strike in both his wind engines and he had to land the plane on the hudson river and you should totally watch the youtube video on it because he's kind of incredible um the point at which both the engines have failed is kind of where we are today um but the plane's got its aerodynamics, it's got its forward momentum, and there is the Hudson we can land on. And we need to behave like Sullenberger in order to land the plane. Um, so lots and lots of things can, can, can go wrong between now and then. We could continue to um, hit the, we could fail to hit 2030 targets, 1.5 degree targets. We could fail to um, deal with the issues of climate migration. We could, um, you know, uh, uh, prevent the over, over privatization um, uh, of key markets and key, key rights. So there's a load of things that can go wrong. And so we have to be active um, in, in all of that. Um, then you get to this question about does technolo technological development own, ever stop? And I'll, I'll be honest, I mean, I've spent now 
25 years in the tech industry and five years I've been thinking, roughly speaking, about this, that particular question. And I've changed my mind in the last year or two um, in that I really do think that we are just starting our explorations around, um, around what we can do with technology, that there are things that become very visible um, totems uh, that we try to chase. So for example, the full self-driving car in, you know, in the city uh, or um, completely simulating or emulating the human brain. Um, and we tend to focus on these as sort of milestones and they turn out to be much, much harder than we, we think. But I, I don't think that technology breakthroughs are largely always driven by, by things like that. I mean, I think it is a fundamental process that is completely, um, completely a human process. It's an intimate human process. You cannot stop humans inventing, you know, wherever you go, it's what makes us human and we create technology tools and those tools then create us. Um, so I don't see physics reasons. Um, I don't see reasons of chemistry or biology or mathematics that get in the way from us continuing to, to invent beyond 2070. Thank you, Cherry. Thank you. Um, really wonderful points you've shared so far. Um, I wanted to ask something that's uh, sort of also uh, been out of interest in my project as well. We talk a lot about technology changing society and I think a lot of times when we talk about responding to those changes, um, we don't really, there's always a fear of pushing against the very much established nature of our society. So uh, I, I finished a book recently, The Misinformation Age, and in the very last chapter, they made a very bold claim saying that if we wanted to stop misinformation, then democracy as it is needs to change and cannot continue as it is, that democratic institutions are inefficient in Western democracies in responding to misinformation brought, up, brought up, uh, about by technology, um, given the way technology is able to trickle through sort of scientific facts, through large populations of people who are not able to evaluate those facts, I guess, credibly, and then that causes a rise share of misinformation, and thus uh, they basically propose models to not restrict free speech, but to alter democracy in a way that would allow scientific facts to better support policy without being uh, misconstrued. Um, mm. So, and you read a lot about societies and technology and how that are responsive to each other. So I just wanted to hear if you have any thoughts on this, on how, like, does our, does technology influence these big, like, not just, you know, like laws and governance, but these big institutions and established events that we've thought as true and as effective. And we never questioned, well, before recent years, we never really questioned democracy. We thought, you know, this is the way to go. But now that with technology and its ability to create all these changes, there's now questions about is the very much always assumed or, you know, taken as sort of just granted um, construction of our society? Do we need to change them? Maybe it's not working anymore. Um, I, I mean, democracy arises as a, um, uh, you know, ar arises as a, as a notion a couple of hundred years um, after the printing press. I mean, there were certain models of, of democracy in um, very small scale uh, communities like sort of the, the Athenian city states, but I don't think we would recognize that as democracy uh, today. Um, and so, of course, we all, we all want to, uh, there's, a, there's a degree of comfort in um, feeling that these key institutions um, don't have to change or won't change. But I think it's very, um, it's a really strong claim, as I said in my opening statement, to say, uh, you know, that every time we make, we, we introduce these new technologies, particularly ones around communication, um, we've seen changes in our political structure or the nature in which we look at power. Um, uh, so it'd be hard for that not to be the case now. So essentially, to your point, um, uh, we've already seen a real evolution in the mechanisms of democracy, uh, it, you know, over the last 50 or 60 years. So, for example, in the 1930s, King George was the first British head of state to use the radio. Um, 
Richard Nixon and, and JFK uh, were amongst in the 1960s, were amongst the first American politicians to change their campaigning to be television centric. And it's widely regarded that Barack Obama in 2008 was the first pre president to use social media. Um, and Donald Trump, of course, has used it better than anybody else. Um, so we would ex to ex expect the changes to happen, but I think it's really uncomfortable for us that they are happening. The question is, how do you, how do you allow those changes to emerge um, while, uh, it, while engaging in them? And when I dug into this, these questions, um, because you may or may not remember, but in, in the UK and in the US and then in France and in Hungary and in Turkey, between about 2015 and 2016, there was a lot of elections were won by uh, populist leaders who had a very um, laissez-faire relationship with the truth um, and with facts and with science. Um, and that's no surprise. But then as you, you, when I went off and then I started to look at the ac academics who study populist movements, I started to see that they were identifying these themes 10, 20 or 30 years earlier, often based around earlier versions of technology, for example, cable TV and talk radio, which is big in the United States. Um, so we would, we would expect this um, to happen. Now, what, what, what could a solution look like? Um, we haven't really found, got great examples of large scale democratic systems that have figured out how to, how to solve this. Um, what, where I think you can look is um, some smaller nations. So um, three I would pull out, two I would pull out would be uh, Estonia um, and Taiwan, where they have got highly digital societies, much higher digital, di digitization than most others. Um, and they've also adapted their mechanisms of democratic accountability. They still go and vote in a checkbox, right, on a piece of paper once every few years. But all of the, th well, except in Estonia, it's done electronically. But all of the things that happen around that behave differently. And if you go there and, you know, I don't know enough about Canada, I'm sorry, I've only got the sort of assumptions that it's a high trust society and everyone's got their doors open uh, right now in case a neighbor needs to borrow some food. Um, but uh, uh, but if you, you compare the levels of trust that exist towards lots of different institutions in Estonia and in Taiwan, um, they're very, very much higher than what you see in, in the UK. So I think that one of the solutions um, as you move forward at times like this is to invest in the things that build trust within society, the processes and the institutions and the messaging critically and the storytelling, um, because that seems to create a kind of more resilient and adaptable group that is willing to take on changes that the potentials of the technology afford. So I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to ask too much of our guests. So we have two more questions. Can we take one more, Azim, or two? It's, it's your choice. A couple. I, I said I've got, um, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got time. I've got a call in a few minutes, but this should be fine. Yeah. Okay. So Danielle and Damien, please. Danielle. Sure. Um, I guess it's a two-part question. We can answer whatever. Um, Yaron Lane also talks about this a lot where, you know, the, the internet and Facebook, uh, et cetera, all these gorgeous, beautiful, free things that are accessible to everybody. But at the same time, you know, the advertising model um, can be dangerous because you're fundamentally your social interactions are, are financed by a third party with ulterior motives. Um, and you also have now an entire generation being raised in forming social interactions and learning how to interact socially by being financed by these third parties. I'm, I'm wondering what your take is on, you know, how can we employ these technologies? Um, what sort of models can we use where we, they're still accessible to everybody, but we, but we you know, retain autonomy, social autonomy, privacy, um, and, you know, sort of sense of, you know, human self. Yeah, it's a really, um... It's a, it's a really important question. Um, there's a short, there's a short term piece to all of this, which is, um, 
you, you know, how do we st stand up against these very, very, uh, the problems that arise from these advertising driven uh, business models and uh, attached to that also. Um, and, and, and this, so, so I, think, I think that there is a set of things that we need to do about privacy. I, I just did a podcast with Carissa Velez and she outlines um, a whole set of, of, of questions. I think there's a more uncomfortable question, which is um, what, what will our relationships w in a techno technologically driven society um, end up end up looking like and there's this idea of the moral techno panic uh, that uh, gets created every time there's a new piece of technology you know rock and roll was going to take a, turn everyone into a satanist back in the 1960s um, and uh, instead they all went off and had a massive party in uh, between 1967 and 68 and no one everyone was quite happy for it so um, you know I, my, the, the consideration that I actually have is, is less do we have to live with these things. I mean, I'm sure we do and we will and people will get adept at them. It, it's about the, the fact that the protections might not exist at the, at the early stage. So one of the things that, we, that, that has happened in, in my generation of parents is my eldest son um, was, is 15 and the, 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 the parents who had kids one or two years older than him were really unprepared with the arrival of Instagram and the smartphone. Uh, and they are dealing with all sorts of issues, right? In a kind of micro practical family way that still echo. Um, I was, a, I've been working in this industry and I was really clear about certain rules. My kids do have freedom to use their phones, but there are very, very clear rules but the broad cohort of parents whose kids are a few years younger than my son, the age of my, my youngest, who's 10, soon 11, are much, much more savvy and they've learned about the risks. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we go through this process um, and to, so that we can actually make use of these, these new systems. I think one of the fundamental problems that we have, and I'm going to give you another book recommendation, um, which you can get from the library. There's a book called The Challenge of Affluence by a guy called Avner Offer, O-F-F-E-R. And Avner is an economic historian from Oxford, and he wrote this book in 2003, so before Facebook. And if you read the first paragraph, five paragraphs of chapter one, or, or maybe it's the introduction, and you, you, you read what he's describing, you'd be thinking, hold on a second, he's describing what Mark Zuckerberg does to us with Facebook. Only he wrote the book while Mark Zuckerberg was still in high school, so I don't know how he, how he did that. The point being that many of the issues that we're tackling uh, today um, have actually been a long-term uh, theme of advertising-driven consumer capitalism, the American model. And, and so how we go about tackling those, um, I think this is where you see Europe doing this slightly differently to the US, is that sure, we can go off and kind of put, it, put privacy con considerations in and stop personalized advertising, but I don't think it tackles the bigger issue that you talk about, which is about human agency and identity and dignity, and how do you align that with a hyper-capitalism? Uh, and, and, you know, again, I'm a, I'm an investor on, on the side. Um, you know, I think investment and profit motive is really important, but I think there are limits to it. And I think one of the things we need to redesign is the, the link that people have with their sense of dignity and agency and the stuff that they buy, wear, or, or sort of brag about on social media. And we need to figure out how to change that relationship. Thanks so much. Thank you. One last question. Damien, you got the last word with uh, Mr. Azar. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for your perspective. Just really exciting, really interesting. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the very first point that you made when, when you were answering um, the 2070 what will be done right question. And you had this idea of that there's a, a sort of inevitability or a reasonable projection, we might, we might say, of uh, the exponential increase of um, uh, technological innovation. Mm -hmm. And the prescient problem that we're facing is just how to uh, distribute it uh, responsibly and in, a, in an ethical way. And so I, I'm wondering 
how do we uh, preserve the innovation while also regulating it uh, in a way that uh, will ensure that it's distributed um, in, in a way that's fair and in a way that's beneficial? Um, because I'm often presented, uh, and I don't have the you know technical expertise to evaluate the claim, but I'm often presented with a perspective in which these two things, regulation and innovation, are, are in opposition or at least in competition with one another. So I'm just wondering what that would look like. Yeah, super, a super interesting um, uh, question. And it's definitely worth your, your digging into. Um, you know, one of the problems with, uh, with regulation is that it often gets um, confused with um, the cap capture of the regulation of technology by special interests. So um, the way in which New York City taxi cabs was regulated was all about capture. Whereas the way, the way in which medical drugs through their trials, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials is regulated is not about capture. It's actually about safety, efficacy, and effectiveness. Um, and so you need to, to choose your, your, um, your kind of regulatory mechanism. Um, the, the second thing is that, you know, the, we've only got here with the internet because the internet was an unregulated space. Um, the telephone companies in the 1980s and the 1990s did everything they possibly could to shut down innovation on, on the phone networks and across the internet. Um, and so we came up with this notion of permissionless innovation, which was a, initially an amazing thing, this idea that I could just pop up a service and try something out without taking someone's permission. Um, and, you know, you'll know that, uh, and this is very true in an economic development context. So, um, there's a Peruvian economist called Hernando de Soto who talks about the fact that in, in many, many of the, the, the countries in the global south, entrepreneurship is really difficult for a couple of reasons. One of which is that the amount of regulation and red tape you have to go through to set up a company is much higher than it is in, say, the United Kingdom or the United States. And so that gets in the way of on, entrepreneurs getting started. So there is, there is a biting point, a kind of a happy, a Goldilocks zone, but it's not a single zone. It depends on um, the technologies which we have to find for how that, that allows us to think about the benefits of the technology without the harms. A um, couple of things that comp, uh, organizations are doing um, that this is happening around the world. People, are, um, regulators are setting up sandboxes. So the idea is that if you want to launch a new bank in the United Kingdom and banking is very regulated, you can do it in a sandbox. And in the sandbox, you play and tr run your experiments under the watchful eye and in constant dialogue with the regulator. So that's one kind of practical approach. But you asked a second question, which I haven't answered, which is a much harder one, which is about um, distributive justice. And particular issue here is about, I think is with the climate crisis, um, sort of distributive justice from the richer part of the world and the global south where the brunt of the climate um, uh, pain will fall. Uh, and I think that's a much, much harder question. Um, I mean, I do think that global commons uh, will help, quite, could help quite a lot. Um, and I also think that the um, uh, declining cost of technology helps a lot. I think there's a geopolitical angle as well, which is that um, there, is, there are spheres of influence that nations are competing for. And I think that they're going to compete not by putting troops on the ground, but by trying to export uh, economic development in some way. Uh, and, and creating a competition around that could also be, be, be good. But I, I, I don't have a great answer for how we um, close uh, what's known as the great divergence, which is a sort of great divergence in living standards and in um, economic well-being that emerged between the, the, the sort of richer world in the global south over the last 200 years. Wow, thank, thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you so much, Azim. Uh, before we let you go, and you don't have to, so would you, do you have a question for us? <laughs> We've been asking you questions, so. It's, you know what, I, I, haven't, I haven't got a question, but I do have a suggestion, um, given the, uh, the nature of the group. I mean, it's such an interesting group of uh, people you have here from different uh, disciplines and um, you know I, somebody was right doing work on indeterminacy someone else on on um, storytelling someone else on um, motivation and then you had particular people thinking about climate finance and so on um, many of the problems that we have to tackle do require um, 
a, a combination of all of those skills. And it's quite, <laughs> I just found that interesting. I just want to reflect back on it uh, being such an interesting story. There's something that Joe Biden said yesterday or two days ago, which was he said, um, uh, you know, we've decided not to cooperate. We can just decide to cooperate. And one of the things that strikes me about many of the issues that we have to tackle with is that we're not up against some fundamental physics barrier, right? This is not about Planck time or something that we can't get our head, you know, going faster than the speed of light. These are, many of these are just collective action issues and they, they are driven by changing the people's mood. Um, and Greta Thunberg has pr proven that to us. And so I think what something that is as powerful as the core technology themselves are the narratives that we can put around them. And, and it's great to hear that there are people in this group who, um, who have that expertise and interest. Well, thank you. Those are beautiful closing words. Thank you so much, uh, Azim. Uh, uh, thank you, Joanna, also for helping us uh, make this, uh, this uh, interview possible. Thanks to You're all welcome. of you You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll keep uh, listening to your uh, amazing, incredible, uh, incredible podcast. Thank you so much, Azim, for the time and your generosity. Much. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.